We're putting our direct die cooling block to test on the Intel Core Ultra 925K, but we didn't remove the IHS. Will it work? Can it handle the heat and let us do some overclocking? Let's jump into this PC build and see what happens. For those of you joining us for the first time, in our last video, we introduced our custom Micro 4D block for Intel CPUs. This block features a copper cooling layer nearly identical in size to the integrated heat spreader or IHS and offers a more efficient cooling solution by removing the heat directly from the silicon die. For a deeper dive into how it works, be sure to check out that video on our channel. While direct die cooling is the most efficient way to remove heat from a chip, it does come with trade-offs. It voids your warranty and requires deleting the CPU a process many consider risky and generally reserved for hardcore overclocking enthusiasts. We've had people ask whether this block can be used without deleting the CPU, and the answer is yes. You can integrate it into a custom cooling loop without deleting, which keeps your warranty and still delivers pretty good performance. Just keep in mind that temperatures won't be as low as with direct die cooling. All right, let's start with the PC build. The first step is installing the Ultra 9285K into the motherboard. In this case, it's the ASUS ROG Strix CA90E. Just be sure to align the arrow on the CPU with the one on the motherboard for correct placement. In this case, we're using the Intel loading mechanism once, just to hold the CPU in place while we work on the backside of the motherboard. You can also do this with the socket cover on. Next, flip the motherboard over, making sure it's stable. We already had the RAM sticks installed, but it was an issue since the height is about the same. For this build, we're using two sticks of the G-Skill Trident C5 memory, totaling 48 gigabytes with a speed of 8,000 megatransfers per second. Next, we'll tape down the backplate to the motherboard to keep it secure when removing the ILM. This is a simple and safe step. You can use different types of tape, but we recommend one that won't leave residue, like magic tape. Cover the edges where the tape crosses to ensure a more secure hold, but don't worry too much. It's easy to peel off the tape once the block is installed. You can now begin removing the ILM using the Torx wrench provided with each block. I've said this before, but make sure to keep the CPU in place to protect the motherboard pins from any damage. Now we're ready to attach the block. First, it's important to loosen the backplate hole threads. The thread in here is generally tight, so you'll need to use the provided Allen wrench to loosen them. A good method is to tighten and loosen each screw about half an inch a few times. You'll know you're done when each screw turns smoothly by hand without the wrench. This simple step is important for applying even pressure across the CPU once the block is installed. This might seem like common sense, but it's easy to forget. Remember to keep the motherboard horizontal at all times as the CPU is unsecure and can easily fall off the board. This is especially important when moving the board from your workspace into a case. Ideally, place the fittings before attaching the block. This allows you to limit how much the block is moved once it's installed on the CPU. Next step is to apply the thermal paste to the IHS using your method of choice. In this case, we apply a line and use a spatula to spread the paste across the area of primary contact. Unlike conventional blocks, the paste doesn't need to cover the entire IHS since only the pin fin area is actively cooled. Make sure to properly orient the block so the holes match up with those on the motherboard. Also to note, we use an off-the-shell mid-tier thermal paste, so depending on your paste of choice, there could be additional upside. Finally, you're free to use liquid metal here instead, but be aware that this voids the CPU warranty since the gallium will diffuse into the IHS and erase the product signage. We can then place each of the four screws into the block by letting them fall into the aligned holes. After placing the screws, turn them using the Allen wrench and only the force of your fingers until you are no longer able. Make sure to tighten in a cross pattern to distribute the pressure evenly over the CPU. As you can tell from the video, it's easy to check the tightness of the screws as many times as you need to. The final and key step in installing the block involves the adjustment of each screw's torque to a particular amount. What we have found during our testing is that a 270 degree turn is needed for each screw, 
in 90 degree increments in a cross pattern to guarantee a successful boot. As you can see in the video, we're using the Torx wrench as a guide to estimate 90 degrees at each step. You can use whatever straight object as long as it's perpendicular to the Allen wrench. There is some headroom for error here, but try to get as close to 270 degrees as possible. To illustrate this point in the video, we're tracking and displaying the amount each screw is turned as we work up to 270 degrees for all four. Also to note, while in the prior step we only used the long vertical leg of the Allen wrench with the force of just our fingertips, this step requires additional torque generated by turning the short horizontal leg instead. Once you're done installing the block, it's time to complete the rest of the assembly. Here's a quick look at our build. The 285K CPU is put together in a tile array, including the compute tile, the system on chip tile, input output tile, the integrated graphics tile, and two filler tiles, which, according to Intel, are there to offer a uniform surface for the heat spreader. Most of the power is directed to the compute tile, which houses the 24 cores for the CPU. As expected, this area is the main hotspot. Intel's diagram provides a clear view of the 8 performance cores and 16 efficient cores, arranged in clusters of 4. We'll reference this layout to present our thermal testing results through a simplified temperature map. Moving on to the results, our thermal testing consisted of four scenarios. In the first case, we used Intel's default settings, resulting in a P-core frequency of 5.3 GHz, an E-core frequency of 4.6 GHz, and a memory speed of 5600 megatransfers per second. We use Cinebench R23 for benchmarking, obtaining a score of 42,340 points with these settings and a peak power draw of 220 watts during these runs. All of these results are averages for multiple and repeatable runs. Based on these settings and power consumption, the temperatures across each core are mapped in this schematic. The contour bar represents a temperature range from 50 to 90 degrees C, with corresponding colors and values displayed for both performance and efficient cores. The temperature distribution in other areas of the compute tile, such as the cache lanes, is not shown here. The display values are the measured peaks or hotspots, 
while the overall temperature profile results from the interaction of these peaks and heat diffusion across the silicon tile. The performance cores average a temperature of 64 degrees C, while the efficient cores sit at 59 degrees C. Comparing this to our results with the deleted i9-14900K, we achieve a similar Cinebench score, but with nearly twice the power consumption, highlighting a significant improvement, at least in terms of power efficiency. With these relatively low temperatures using our cooling block, there's plenty of thermal headroom for overclocking. For the second case, we changed the BIOS settings to the ASUS AI overclocking profile, resulting in a P-core frequency of 5.4 GHz, an E-core frequency of 4.7 GHz, and a memory speed of 5600 megatransfers per second. With these settings, the Cinebench R23 score improved by approximately 1000 points over the baseline, while power consumption reached 268 watts. As expected, the core temperatures are higher under these settings, with an average peak core temperature of 72 degrees C and 69 degrees C for the efficient cores. A notable observation is that the central performance cores have higher temperatures since these are surrounded by the E core clusters, which increases the in play thermal resistance. This also explains why the southern pair of P cores runs warmer than the northern pair. The northern P cores do not have neighboring silicon or power intensive regions, whereas the southern P cores are adjacent to the system on chip die, leading to a lower in play thermal diffusion. Moving on to the third case, we switched to a manual overclocking profile in the BIOS. The peak core frequency was set to 5.4 GHz across all cores, while the E core frequency was increased from 4.7 to 5.0 GHz. Also, the memory speed was raised to 7200 mega transfers per second. With this parameter set up, the Cinebench R23 score climbed to 44,551 points with a peak power consumption of 296 watts. Once again, the cores are running warmer due to the increased power input. The resulting temperature profile shows an average peak core temperature of 76 degrees C and 79 degrees C for the E cores. Note how the E cores are now running hotter than the P cores as a result of the steep overclocking applied to these clusters. We can also observe a similar temperature pattern to the previous cases where the central P cores exhibit the highest temperatures due to their boundary conditions. These are followed by the southern P cores, while the northern P cores remain the coolest due to their favorable location. For the fourth and final case, the P core frequency was raised from 5.4 to 5.6 GHz across all cores, while the E core frequency remained at 5.0 GHz, with the memory speed also maintained at 7200 mega transfers per second. With this configuration, we achieve a not too shabby Cinebench score of 45,358 points with a peak power consumption of 319 watts. The resulting temperature map for this final case is now shown. With an average peak or temperature of 80 degrees C and an average e core temperature of 78 degrees C. An interesting observation is that none of the cores are thermally throttling despite the high power draw and cooling with the CPU's original IHS and standard thermal paste. These results demonstrate the effectiveness of our cooling block, allowing users to maintain their warranty while getting pretty decent overclocking performance. For those interested in more testing details, here's a video of one of the test runs for Case 4. We use Hardware Info 64 to gather readings from the motherboard sensors, providing valuable data such as core frequencies, temperatures, throttling alarms, power consumption, voltages, and more. For this particular run, we score 45,574 points in Cinebench R23. To summarize our thermal testing with the microfluidic block, we're showing here a side-by-side -side comparison of all the cases, including their Cinebench scores, peak power draw, and the P-core and E-core frequencies. We believe these temperature maps, commonly used in thermal and electronics engineering, offer a better insight of temperature distribution and how applications can be optimized. We identified trends showing how the E core clusters affect the central hotspots on the P cores, as well as the impact of adjacent silicon tiles. We hope you liked it. It's also important to note that these overclocking benchmarks serve as a baseline for potential customers, emphasizing that our overclocking setup is far from fully optimized. This leaves plenty of room for enthusiasts to push performance even further. 
We're also aware that the Arrow Lake architecture sees a significant performance boost with CUDIM memory. However, we didn't use it here due to its highest price tag and limited availability from retailers at the time of making this video. Our cooling block is compatible with Intel's 12th, 13th, 14th gen and the latest Ultra Core 200 series CPUs. As shown in this video, one of its key advantages is its versatility. It can be used with both deleted CPUs and stock CPUs with the IHS intact. The height difference is easily adjusted by swapping out the mounting screws, with all required screws included with each block. If you're interested in purchasing one, be sure to check the links in the description below. Those are our results with the Ultra 9 285K. It's a clear improvement in multi-core performance and power efficiency for productivity tasks compared to the previous generation. For instance, a PC like this would be a good choice for engineers requiring a local workstation for software such as computational fluid dynamics or finite element analysis because it has a strong multi-core performance. However, when it comes to gaming performance, that's a different story. There are better options out there such as the AMD Ryzen 7 9800X 3D, which excels in gaming thanks to its 3D cache technology. We'll be testing those chips soon, so stay tuned. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing for more content like this, and we'll close things out uh, showing the different lighting modes of this computer because why not?